All right, it is 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Very pleased to welcome Dr. Allison Morris as our speaker today. Uh, before I have a chance to introduce Dr. Morris, I want to just start with a few uh, brief announcements. One is that we only have one Medical Grand Rounds left for this academic year. Uh, we'll be closing out the educational series with Dr. Callum McRae next Wednesday. He's a cardiologist, uh, developmental biologist, and geneticist from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, and then we, we will restart Medical Grand Rounds on July 27th this year. So we're taking a much shorter summer break um, so we can have more excellent speakers come to campus. Uh, keep an eye out for the 2022-2023 schedule in the month of June. I want to remind everyone that you do get CME and mock credits for Grand Rounds, and so please use the link that Kelly has placed in the chat. And to please use the Q&A feature to ask questions of Dr. Morris as the talk goes on. Sam King and myself will take those questions and we will have a conversation with Dr. Morris in the uh, closing minutes of her time. So I am really very pleased to welcome Dr. Allison Morris. She is the chief of the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care uh, and a professor of medicine with secondary appointments in immunology and clinical and translational research at the University of Pittsburgh. She holds the UPMC Chair of Translational Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. She's also the director of the University of Pittsburgh's HIV Lung Research Center, as well as the director of the Center for Medicine and the Microbiome, and is the vice chair for clinical research within the Department of Medicine. She uh, did her undergrad work where she graduated magna cum laude from Harvard. She was AOA at the uh, medical school at Duke University. She was in an intern and a resident at UCSF and was a pulmonary and critical care fellow at UCSF as well before completing the Clinical Scholars Program also in San Francisco in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and the Clinical Research Training Program. Her research interests focus on pulmonary complications of HIV infections and on the lung microbiome in chronic and acute diseases. She works with a very large cohort uh, epidemiologic studies, as well as translational investigations applying physiology and molecular techniques to patient populations. Dr. Morris continues her clinical work in the medical intensive care unit and in the post-COVID recovery clinic and is dedicated to mentoring trainees in the fields of HIV disease, pulmonary disease, as well as the microbiome. And of course, her work is um, absolutely remarkable. Uh, all of her grant funding uh, and clinical and research efforts to date have led to over 170 original manuscripts, um, as well as an additional 200 presentations, abstracts, posters, and publications. It truly is my honor to welcome Dr. Allison Morris to talk about the lung microbiome and its clinical implications. Dr. Morris. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be visiting with you today. I'm sorry it couldn't be in person. Um, I always love coming to Denver and seeing all my pulmonary and, and Pittsburgh friends out there. Uh, so I will hopefully uh, be able to get out there at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, so my talk today is going to be about the lung microbiome and its clinical implications. And I put the lung in parentheses because I'm going to, while I'm focusing on the lung, um, it's obviously not in isolation. And I'll also be talking about the blood, the gut, um, and, and some about the mouth. Um, this is obviously a very broad title. Um, I think uh, whenever it was a few months ago when they asked for my title, I, I made it purposefully broad so I could kind of give myself some room to focus on, uh, to choose what I was gonna focus on. And so the clinical implications that I'm really gonna be talking about today um, are primarily in the intensive care unit. So I'll start off with a case. Um, and this was a very common case a couple years ago, um, but uh, at least uh, here, and I think elsewhere, we really haven't seen too many patients um, with ARDS from the flu uh, in the past couple of years. But nonetheless, this is a 32-year-old male who came in with H1N1 pneumonia. Uh, he was treated with vancomycin, cefepime, and oseltamivir. Uh, cultures from his uh, BAL, as well as his pleural fluid, grew out MRSA, and his initial cefepime was stopped, and he was continued on vancomycin and Tamiflu. Fortunately, his fevers uh, persisted, and his condition did not really get better. So we're kind of left with this clinical question that we see pretty commonly uh, in the ICU, and what are the next steps here in this patient? Um, we could repeat cultures and hold antibiotics until we get those results. We could repeat cultures and start zosin empirically. We could check fungal cultures, a beta D glucan and galactomannan, or we could do that fungal workup plus add empiric antifungals. And so, so I don't have the, the uh, response uh, enabled on this because this is really more you know, a, a, a question to frame the discussion and the, the data I'm gonna show you. 
Um, I think you could argue for the first or second response, um, you know, potentially with the, with the fungal, depending on how the what the patient situation was. Um, but what was done in this case um, was that cultures were repeated, uh, and the team initially started uh, empiric zosin. Cultures all came back negative, and the patient improved. So this is a, a common scenario that we face and a, a difficult problem. Um, we're often faced with patients, particularly in the ICU, who we suspect clinically have an infection. Um, and we know that time to effective antibiotics improves the outcome, but our cultures take several days and they may be insensitive and miss um, many different organisms that can uh, cause a clinical infection. And we have to balance these giving, giving empiric antibiotics to treat an infection with the risks of that, right? We have adverse effects and toxicity. Um, it adds healthcare costs. We get secondary infections and C. diff, and we may contribute to the problem of antibiotic resistance. So the clinicians treating this patient didn't have access um, to any uh, of micro, the microbiome data that I'm going to show you, but we were fortunate um, in having that data available to help us understand why this patient improved, right? Because often you start antibiotics, the patient gets better, and you left there wondering, well, did I actually treat something or was it just time and the patient would have gotten better anyway? Um, so this patient was part of uh, a big ICU uh, cohort and biorepository study um, that was started by Brian McVeary um, several years ago um, and then continued, and he's down here in the uh, left-hand corner, um, and has been really continued and expanded by Georgios Kitsios, who's a K-funded faculty um, in my group and actually has his R01 being uh, reviewed today. So I'm hoping the fact that I'm talking about his research uh, will give him good luck. And he has taken this cohort um, and enrolled uh, over 500 patients uh, with longitudinal sampling of oral swabs, tracheal aspirates, blood, um, and stool or rectal swabs in order to look at the microbiome in the ICU and how it might inform our care of patients. Um, so for this particular patient, um, we had an endotracheal aspirate that we did 16S sequencing on. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute for people who may not be familiar with it. But basically this is um, a nucleic acid-based sequencing that allows us to detect all the bacteria in a given sample. So even things that don't grow. Um, and when he did this sequencing, what he found was this patient had a predominance of fusobacterium in the endotracheal sample, which is sensitive to zosin and probably explains why he, why he had persistent fevers and then got better with zosin. Um, so, I, you know, as I said, I want to use this um, to sort of frame the rest of the talk and then how we might use microbiome sequencing um, in taking care of patients in the ICU and how it might shift um, how we approach patients um, in the next, you know, five to 10 years. I want to sort of start off uh, with giving a little background on the microbiome and the lung microbiome. I know there are several really great groups out there who work on this, but this may not be familiar to everyone. So I'll give you some definitions um, and a brief overview of some of the methods, and then talk about the work that we've done applying this in the ICU. Um, and microbiome um, techniques can be applied in several different ways, um, as shown in that case, and as I'll show you uh, some additional data, uh, very powerful for diagnosis of infections, but microbiome techniques can also be used to help us understand differences in outcomes in patients um, in the ICU, and also to help get at the mechanisms of those differences um, in, in the outcomes. And by putting all of this together, uh, I hope I could show you that perhaps these techniques can be used in a theranostic application or a technique that can be, can be applied to both diagnose and help treat uh, a condition. So to start off with a couple terms, you may have heard microbiota and microbiome, and they are somewhat different. Um, the microbiota are the microbes that collectively inhabit an ecosystem, be that the soil or the lung or the gut uh, in, a, in a patient. Um, and this uh, includes all the different uh, types of microbes, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And it takes advantage of the fact that you can really detect all of these organisms by nucleic acid amplification and sequencing much more sensitively than you can with historical culture techniques, okay? 
The microbiome is the totality of all these organisms, their genomes, molecular products, and the surrounding environmental conditions. So really the whole microbial um, community. Um, the microbiome, as I'm sure everyone realizes, has been really over the past decade or so uh, discovered to contribute to many, many diseases, both acute and chronic. Um, you can there take almost any uh, condition uh, and PubMed it, and there's going to be something that comes up with a uh, relationship to the microbiome. The majority of the microbes in the human body are in the GI tract, and they have a myriad of uh, of uh, impact on the human host from metabolism, antimicrobial peptides, epithelial barrier function. Um, and much of the work in the microbiome has focused uh, on the gut. However, um, being a pulmonologist, I was obviously interested in the lung microbiome and, um, and you know, there was this historic teaching that the lung was actually sterile and that there weren't any, any organisms in there. And when you think about it, it doesn't make a ton of sense, right? It's this huge surface that interacts constantly with the environment. You inhale different things. Um, people aspirate all the time. Um, there's no reason to think that there would not be organisms there. Um, so in some work that we did um, in collaboration with uh, one of the groups or the groups in Colorado, as well as other groups across the country, um, that's also been replicated uh, by, by other, uh, other um, research groups, um, we came to figure out that there is a lung microbiome. Um, it's very low in the normal uh, human, and it's not nearly the number of bacteria organisms that you see in the gut, but you can sequence bacteria there. And they're primarily oral bacteria, likely from the fact that we all aspirate a certain amount um, you know, throughout the day. And that while this is often cleared out, you can detect these oral bugs uh, in the normal lung. Um, the lung can become, uh, the lung microbiome can become disordered uh, in various diseases, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. All right, so how do we look uh, at the microbiome when we're doing these studies? Um, I'm going to focus primarily on bacteria because that's where most of the work done, and in large part uh, because these are there, the bacteria are so common um, in the microbiome, and also the techniques are, are much easier um, than looking at fungi and viruses. Um, so sort of the basic, one of the most basic techniques we use to look at the bacterial microbiome is called 16S or RNA sequencing. Um, and this, what this does is it sequences a gene, the 16S RNA gene that's present in all bacteria. It's essential for uh, transcribing mRNA into amino acids and proteins. Um, and it takes advantage of the fact that there are conserved regions of this gene that are common through all bacteria. So you can amplify that with PCR, but then the, the bacteria also have these variable regions shown by these V numbered areas. And sequencing those can give you identification of particular individual bacteria. This is sort of the workflow that's used in 16S. You get a sample microbial community, whether that's the lung or the gut, um, you extract the, the DNA um, and then amplify and sequence the 16S RNA site in the bacteria. You then take the sequences that you have and align them. So sequences that are 97% or more similar are considered what's called operational taxonomic units or OTUs. And you can roughly think of this as species of bacteria. Now with this technique, we, we usually cannot get down to the species level, but it tells us um, how many types of bacteria are there and how many of them. And then we use various techniques to analyze um, uh, those different bacteria. Um, this field of, of uh, microbiome analytics has really been exploding um, over the past several years. But um, just to give you a couple of the very basic, most common things that we look at, the first thing is a relative abundance. So just based on those sequences you get, what are the bacteria and what are their relative amounts um, in a given population or a given biological sample, okay? After that, we want to see how do the communities compare. Um, and one of the ways to do that is looking at what's called alpha diversity. And that shows you how variable is a particular community. Um, and you look at the number and the evenness of the different bacterial species. And so a high alpha diversity is often associated with health. And it's like this coral reef, lots of different species, all sort of evenly distributed. 
Low alpha diversity you can think of as like the C. diff gut microbiome dominated by one um, bacteria um, that takes over. Another common metric you'll see um, is beta diversity, and that's how different are my different samples. Um, so this is, and this can be visualized uh, in different ways. Um, this is a, often by a principal coordinate analysis um, or similar, and that's shown here. And each dot in this is, a, is the bacterial community from a different sample. So either a different patient, um, you know, the lung versus the gut. Um, and how close the dots are or how similar your communities are. And so you can just, can, you can plot each individual community and then you can sum them. So for example, this community in black is a healthy community that differs overall from, from a disease community um, shown in blue. All right, so that's 16S and that's sort of the most basic, um, what we call amplicon sequencing. Um, there are lots of other ways to look at the microbial communities. There's metagenomics, which gets all of the nucleic acid um, in a sample, and it can tell you bacteria, it tells you viruses, fungi, and gives you much more specificity. You can also look at metatranscriptomics, um, which is looking at the RNA and which genes are being transcribed, so what, uh, what, the, what the organisms are doing. Um, and you can also look at metabolomics, um, what the organisms are producing and how that might be impacting your host. Okay, so we've been very interested uh, in the past few years on how we can apply this next generation sequencing to diagnosis of infections in the ICU. And this was um, in large part the basis of uh, Dr. Kitsios's K work. Um, and he wondered whether he could take this sort of old fashioned approach to, to uh, diagnosing infection in the ICU, where you take a respiratory set specimen or a blood sample, you do microbiologic cultures, while starting broad spectrum antibiotics and whether this could be improved um, by doing sequencing. And so the first study uh, that he did using uh, the cohort I told you about um, was to take 56 mechanically ventilated patients, take endotracheal aspirates from them, um, do the 16S sequencing. And of these 12 uh, had a culture confirmed um, infection and 44 did not. And then he looked at the alpha diversity as well as the composition of these communities. And what he found, you can see here. So the culture positive cases had a much lower alpha diversity. So meaning they were dominated more by one um, bacteria, which is not surprising. They grew a bacteria. So, so you know, kind of expected um, that they would have a low diversity. And when we looked at the beta diversity, so comparing the different um, communities overall, those that were culture positive differed significantly from those that were culture negative. But what was interesting was if you looked further in the culture negative group and looked at the alpha diversity, there's this whole group down here that has a low alpha diversity, sort of similar to those that are culture positive. Um, and these patients also had greater systemic levels of IL-6 and TNF alpha, suggesting that they were, uh, there was inflammation in response to something. And so we wondered, could we be missing um, pneumonia in this, in this cohort? Um, when he went and looked at which bacteria you could find by sequencing um, in each of the patients, um, what he found was in those that were culture positive here on the left side, um, the dominant bacteria were pathogens. And I've summarized those in red. And so each of these bars is a different patient. Um, and this is the relative abundance of each type of bacteria adding up to 100%. Um, in the culture negative ones, they Many of them had um, a dominance of different oral bacteria, so shown in blue, and this is a mix of bacteria. Um, but what was interesting, those ones that had that low alpha diversity also had dominance of a respiratory pathogen. So things like staph, pseudomonas um, were the dominant pathogens that we found um, in those patients. So suggesting that perhaps these patients um, would have benefited from antibiotics um, and actually were infected. Now, the flip side of this is all these patients with this oral bacterial dominance 
likely did not have an infection, right? There may have been some who had an aspiration pneumonia, but in general, um, these were probably not pathogens. And almost all of these people got uh, antibiotics. Um, they were you know, intubated, they were in the ICU, they were sick. Um, so in general, they got uh, empiric antibiotics. And what Georgios did was to do a theoretical experiment where he took, uh, where he took these patients and said, if we had had this sequencing information when they came into the hospital and we could have made antibiotic choices based on that, what would the impact have been? And what he found was that there would have been a 50% reduction in empiric antibiotics and almost a quarter of total courses of antibiotics um, avoided. Um, so really pretty striking um, if we were able to have this information when taking care of patients initially. I'm gonna show you um, one more case I thought was really interesting to suggest um, that sequencing may be superior to culture. Um, this is a patient who came in with septic thrombophobitis, blood cultures uh, grew fusobacterium. Um, we, we don't have like an inordinate amount of fusobacterium in Pittsburgh. These are just two cases that happen to be interesting. Um, BAL was negative on the patient on day one. Uh, the patient was treated with appropriate antibiotics, um, unfortunately progressed to ARDS with hypoxemia, uh, fevers and shock, and developed uh, an empyema and a pneumothorax. Multiple um, bronchoscopic cultures um, were negative. Eventually, the pleural fluid grew up mycoplasma hominis, so an unusual pathogen that really we would not have thought of and would not have covered empirically. If you looked back at this patient's endotracheal aspirate and sequenced it, what you found was at the beginning when he came in, um, the majority of the bacteria um, in the endotracheal aspirate were fusobacterium. But almost a quarter of the bacteria detected initially was this mycoplasma. And as um, he was treated for fusobacterium, the amount of fusobacterium that we detected by sequence decreased in the lung um, and the amount of mycoplasma increased. So suggesting, you know, perhaps if we had had this information earlier on, we could have initiated appropriate therapy um, and saved him from some of these complications. Now, this all sounds really great, but what I've kind of glossed over is that this really is not very helpful. Um, in real time for clinical diagnosis. So 16S is slow. There are biases in the PCR that, it may, uh, that you may miss um, certain organisms. It's limited resolution. It can't get you to the species level. It can't get you resistance. And it's only for bacteria. Fortunately, we have other techniques um, that may uh, improve the clinical application of these kind of uh, approaches. Um, so we can use metagenomics. Um, so sequencing uh, the entire genome of the organisms there. Um, and this can be done, this is the, this little machine called uh, the MinION, very cutely named. It's um, about $1,000. Uh, it is smaller than your iPhone. And what it, it can get you, um, all the bacteria, viruses and fungi, as well as resistance patterns. Um, and it can do that with some modifications and a lot of hard work in about six to eight hours. So in something that could be clinically relevant. Uh, and so we've looked at this uh, in a pilot study, and this is work done by Li Bing Yang, who is a Chinua um, exchange student uh, in our group. And she had eight cases of culture positive pneumonia um, and looked at this with the MinION um, and found that in all the cases, the MinION detected the most common, uh, the, the pathogen that was cultured, shown here in red with the culture dish next to it. Um, and that pathogen was over 90 fold greater in abundance um, than any of the other um, pathogens uh, sequenced. She also looked at some culture negative cases and interestingly found like, for example, in this one case, which Klebsiella and staff suggesting perhaps um, pathogens that were missed. Um, and in several cases sequenced um, uh, candida uh, which often we get in cultures and sort of blow off as just, uh, you know, contamination or oral flora. Uh, and I'll show you some data in a bit that suggests that they maybe um, it's not as innocent as we think. The other approach uh, that we've taken uh, to using these kind of techniques to identify infections in the ICU is by looking at the blood. 
Um, endotracheal aspirates are not that hard to get in intubated patients, but obviously um, it'd be nice to be able to have this information before your patient gets intubated. Um, so this is work done by Hope Yang, who is another Tsinghua student uh, in our group, using a technique called, um, by a company called Carius, um, which is actually clinically available. And this looks for circulating my microbial cell-free DNA. Um, and he looked at uh, uninfected controls, people with culture negative pneumonia. So the clinicians suspected that they had pneumonia, but the cultures didn't grow um, and culture positive pneumonia. And he found that the total load of cell-free DNA was generally pretty low in the controls, was higher in particularly in a, in a, not all, but in a group of the culture negative individuals, and then highest in those who were culture positive, suggesting that again, this might be another approach to get better uh, sensitivity and definition of infections. All right, so I think if you think about this all together, um, perhaps this may move the needle in the next few years um, to reimagine pneumonia diagnosis and to move us away from these microbiologic cultures that take a long time and may not be that sensitive um, to where we can take respiratory specimens or blood and do culture independent techniques and rapidly and sensitively identify uh, pathogens. So the, one of the other ways we've been looking at uh, using microbiome uh, to inform care in the ICU is in trying to understand why our patient is so sick. Um, so this is a case of a 53-year-old woman who had no um, significant past medical history, came in with fevers, dyspnea, um, diagnosed uh, with H. flu pneumonia. Now, many times this is something you can treat outpatient, give people antibiotics, and they do fine. Um, this patient unfortunately had a rapidly evolving course, um, was admitted to the ICU and developed ARDS and multi-system organ failure. And the question is why, why is this? And can we identify these patients earlier? Um, so just take a, a minute to talk about ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. I know this is uh, very familiar to the Colorado uh, group uh, where the idea originated um, as clinical syndrome defined by hypoxemia, diffuse radiographic edema, and a risk factor for lung injury. Um, prior to COVID, it was responsible for 10% of ICU admissions uh, and, and a high mortality with long-term morbidity. Uh, and despite uh, lots of effort, no broadly efficacious pharmacologic uh, therapy for the syndrome. And so a lot of interest in the field has been dissecting the heterogeneity of ARDS. Uh, and this is work that's come out of Carolyn Colfi's lab in UCSF, as well as replicated by uh, other groups. And uh, her group took an unselected ARDS population and performed latent class analysis and found that there are two ARDS subphenotypes, the so-called hyperinflammatory and the hypoinflammatory groups. Um, and these, are, these groups have biological differences. It's based on differences in um, inflammatory cytokines, tissue injury, um, metabolic acidosis, and organ dysfunction, which are all more common in the hyperinflammatory group. Uh, this is associated with worse outcomes. So membership in the hypoinflammatory subphenotype of ARDS uh, portends worse survival. And it may also influence response to uh, treatments um, that uh, there may be differential uh, impact of treatments. And that's maybe one of the reasons many of our ARDS studies fail to find uh, uh, impact because these patients are grouped together. And when we look uh, at the phenotypes, uh, they may actually have different responses. So we asked the question, can next generation sequencing and, and understanding the host microbiome help us understand some of these differences in host response and outcomes? Because many of these inflammatory pathways are those that are stimulated by pathogens. Um, and so perhaps even beyond what we culture, um, could, could the microbiome uh, be playing a role? And again, so this is another paper by Georgios. Uh, he looked at uh, 301 mechanically ventilated patients with acute respiratory failure, uh, did oropharyngeal swabs, endotracheal aspirates, and plasma samples. Did 16S uh, out of the oral and the endotracheal samples. And then did this technique called uh, Dirichlet multinomial models or DMM. And this is basically a cluster analysis. So it takes um, the bacterial data and clusters the patients agnostically um, into different groups. 
He also did a Luminex panel for the host response uh, biomarkers and used that to, as well as the clinical data to identify hyper and hypoinflammatory phenotypes um, within the cohort. Then look to see whether the bacterial clusters uh, related uh, to the subphenotypes and whether they related uh, to uh, outcomes from intensive care. Um, and what he found was really interesting. Um, first off, overall, uh, the bacterial communities of people who died um, from uh, after during their stay in the, in the ICU were different than those who survived. In particular, the alpha diversity was lower um, in those who died than in those who survived. When he looked um, at uh, the clusters that were identified by that DMM um, analysis, what he found was the bacterial sequencing broke down into three different groups um, that, that were were different both in their patient characteristics and also in the alpha diversity. So the first one that had the highest alpha diversity was this cluster three. Um, and that the bacteria in that cluster was primarily oral bacteria. So as I mentioned, usually what we expect to find in the lung and a mix of different bacteria. Cluster one was intermediate uh, in the alpha diversity. And while it had um, some oral bacteria, also started seeing some things like staph um, and strep and a little more um, unevenness uh, in the different uh, types of bacteria in the samples. Cluster two, which had the lowest alpha diversity, was much more dominated by pathogens. And you started seeing things like Pseudomonas, Stenotrophomonas, um, staph um, in cluster two. And when we looked more at cluster two, um, we found that that was actually associated with being in the hyperinflammatory subphenotype. Um, and it wasn't just because these patients were infected. So only about 44% of them had a clinical suspicion of pneumonia and only about a third were actually culture positive. So being in a pathogen, pathogen dominant cluster, regardless of whether you had your culture be positive or not, was associated um, with worse outcome and adjusted for things like age, COPD and antibiotic um, exposures. When he looked at these clusters um, in relationship to outcomes, so survival on the left here and liberation um, from mechanical ventilation, found kind of a, a dose response um, in the clusters. So cluster three, which had the greatest alpha diversity, the most oral bacteria had the best survival, most likely to come off of uh, the ventilator. Cluster one was in the middle and cluster two had the worst survival um, and, um, least likely uh, to be extubated. Um, he used uh, these clusters uh, as well as the, and looking at the diversity um, as well as the dominant pathogens and came up with a fairly simple dysbiosis index um, and found that if you had dysbiosis, um, your survival um, and your uh, chances of being extubated were much lower. And I'm showing you the endotracheal aspirate uh, data, but the oral data was actually quite similar to this, which is, um, I think, really interesting. First, because it's a non-invasive sample, um, and second, because it's something that is, is maybe amenable um, to interventions. So, you know, to go back to this um, framework of the heterogeneity of ARDS, uh, I think our data, you know, while it's very hard to tell what's cause and effect, there are obviously lots of um, factors that influence outcomes, influence your phenotype in the ICU that may also be influencing um, the microbiome of the lung or other sites. Um, but I think it's very interesting to think about whether these um, are actually stimulating an inflammatory response and are responsible for some of the poor outcomes that we see and whether this is something that we could intervene on, again, if we had real-time microbiome data. So the last um, story I wanna tell you about uh, is a relatively recent uh, area that we've moved into and in looking at the microbiome. Um, and this is based on the fact that, well, we've looked at the microbiome in the lung and perhaps uh, it is having a local uh, response um, and causing damage locally. But we know that the lung becomes leaky um, in ARDS and has epithelial dysfunction, um, and, which is worsened by things like hypoxemia and ischemia, um, and that the systemic mediators may uh, you know, there may be a uh, systemic uh, translocation of inflammatory mediators, but potentially also of 
either the microbes in their entirety um, out to the systemic circulation, but potentially also DNA from the microbes, um, either bacterial or viral, or cell wall components like beta D glucan, which is a, a very inflammatory component of the fungal cell wall. Um, and so we were interested in seeing perhaps um, this might uh, be something that's playing another role uh, in heterogeneity of ARDS um, and uh, may also be uh, something that leads us in a different direction in terms of therapies. Um, so if you remember back to that data that I showed you that we could detect cell-free microbial DNA um, in patients uh, in the ICU who are intubated. When we looked at the relationship of that uh, cell-free DNA, we found that those with higher levels were more likely to be um, in the hyperinflammatory phenotype. So suggesting that there was more systemic involvement, more inflammation. Um, this was too small of a cohort to really say anything about um, outcomes, but I think suggests that perhaps um, it's not good to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, microbial DNA um, in your circulation. Um, and this was, this was any sort, any DNA um, that we could detect in the blood, but primarily it was bacteria when we looked at it. We also were very interested in what might be happening um, with the fungal microbiome. And I haven't talked very much about that. And it's, as I said, been sort of um, a fungus has not been as well studied uh, as bacteria, um, but I actually got into looking at microbiome because of an interest uh, in the role uh, that fungi might be playing in the lung. Um, and so we thought perhaps uh, fungal components like beta D glucan might be detectable in the blood and might be translocating from the lung or potentially other body sites. Um, and we had a bit of data that uh, the lung uh, microbiome, so the, the fungi in the lung might also be dysregulated um, in patients uh, with uh, respiratory failure. And this is shown here. Um, this is data from Noelle Britton who uh, got her PhD in my lab and is now doing a postdoc at Hopkins. And when she did uh, sequencing for fungi, which is done fairly similarly to the 16S for bacteria, but using a different gene, um, she found very analogous findings. So um, the group that had a low fungal diversity, which was primarily Canada, um, had worse outcomes, more inflammation um, than the group that had a higher lung fungal diversity. So we thought we would follow this up with looking to see um, whether a fungal product beta D-glucan could be detected in the blood. Um, and what we did was look at 453 patients with acute respiratory failure um, from our cohort who had no evidence of invasive fungal infection. So these weren't, these weren't patients who you know, had anything cultured um, uh, from any body site. And what we found um, was that having uh, this uh, fungal uh, uh, product, the beta D-glucan, uh, was associated with inflammation. We did a panel of biomarkers and basically every single one was higher um, in patients um, with higher BDG. So things like procalcitonin, IL-8, IL-6 were all elevated. And when we looked um, at those, uh, at the BDG levels in our two uh, uh, ARDS subphenotypes, those with the hyperinflammatory phenotype um, had higher BDG levels. We then went and did sort of a similar uh, study uh, looking at ICU outcomes um, by the BDG level and those that had a BDG level less than 40 um, had a higher survival um, and then those who had a BDG greater than 40. Um, and I would say what was really also um, what was uh, notable about this cohort is that there were a significant number around 15% of these patients who had BDG levels that were higher than what we use, what we think of as the clinical cutoff um, for a fungal infection, but did not ever grow a fungus. Um, and also, you know, there's a, there's a theoretical, um, association of uh, false positive BDG with uh, zosin and, and beta-lactam antibiotics. And we did not see that when we um, you know, looked at, the, at those relationships. So this was independent of that and independent of any fungal infection. Um, the, this clearly raises the question of where the fungus is coming from. And I showed you a schematic um, that suggests that we're, it may come from the lung and the dysbiosis data suggests that um, as well, but the gut is also 
uh, has a lot of fungus. And we know uh, from previous work um, that uh, people who have more candida in their, in their lungs um, in the ICU uh, have worse outcome. Um, and that antibiotic use is associated with fungal overgrowth in the gut um, and uh, may lead to invasive fungal infections um, and worse outcome. So we did a couple of things to kind of indirectly try to get at where the fungus might be coming from. Um, when we looked in the lung um, at respiratory cultures that were positive for yeast, and this is again getting to this idea of, you know, we often see BALs or other respiratory cultures that come back with candida and we say, oh, that's probably nothing. Um, so this was any culture that grew candida or, or a pathogen. Um, those that were uh, positive for any sort of yeast had higher peripheral um, blood BDG levels, um, suggesting that perhaps uh, this is related to what's going on in the lung. We also, in a very small group uh, of patients, did fungal sequencing uh, in uh, stool samples um, and found that the number of fungal reads was very low in patients who had low BDG levels, but was higher um, in patients uh, that had higher uh, BDG in the blood. And so we can't really put our nickel down on where it's coming from. This suggests that it could be both gut and lung. Uh, and actually Georgios has uh, an RO3 to look and try to see whether this can be, be sorted out. And the reason that I think it's important uh, to know where it's coming from uh, and to understand this phenomenon is that this suggests potential novel therapies. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this actually in MISC in kids uh, with uh, COVID infection. And so in the past, I believe, year, there's been a case report and a case series um, of, uh, of looking at uh, microbial translocation of uh, SARS virus um, from kids with MISC. And what they found um, was that the viral RNA leads uh, to increased leakiness in the gut um, with increased zonulin release um, and loss of tight junctions. And then the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein um, can translocate uh, through to the blood and cause a hyperinflammatory response. Um, and in the, a couple of these kids, they use lorazotide, which is a zonulin antagonist, which decreases epithelial permeability, and found that there was resolution of inflammation and decrease um, of the detection of the, of the spike protein. Um, so if we have something similar going on um, with fungal translocation or other or bacterial translocation, um, Perhaps uh, you could give something like lorazotide to help the epithelial leak, um, or also metformin um, is actually a really interesting uh, potential agent because it enhances epithelial tight junctions, inhibits inflammation, and also alters the gut microbiome. So while I think you know, these data are certainly early stages, um, it raises uh, an interesting new uh, avenue of um, therapy. So I'm gonna leave you with a case uh, just as sort of thought provoking and how we might be applying these data uh, in future years. Uh, so 45 year old male with COVID-19 pneumonia and ARDS, uh, he develops, he initially improves and then develops new fevers. Bacterial cultures are negative and a beta D glucan um, is 80 milligrams per mil. This is a pretty common scenario. Um, obviously a lot of concern about fungal secondary infections in patients with severe COVID um, and always kind of a clinical dilemma. So what do you do? You ignore the BDG as secondary to Zosin, start any fungals, start a goals of care discussion because you think you know that this uh, portends a poor outcome or add metformin or lorazotide. Um, and I think we don't know at this point. I think right now everybody would favor starting antifungals, um, but I think a lot of these things may uh, change in the upcoming years as we understand the role of the microbiome uh, more clearly uh, in ICU patients. And so I would leave you with um, this theranostic paradigm for ARDS uh, treatment and for treatment of patients in the ICU with pneumonia. Currently, we uh, obviously treat the lung infection or the blood infection. Um, we may give uh, uh, anti-inflammatories, which um, outside of you know, uh, IL-6 antagonists and COVID-19 have not 
shown great uh, promise, um, but I think using the microbiome, we may be able to really improve on this. Um, we can use it for rapid sensitive diagnosis uh, that will then allow us to target antimicrobials. Perhaps we can prevent uh, ventilator associated pneumonia and other secondary infections um, and look at things like phage therapy to, to change the microbiome, microbial replacement. We do, um, you know, there's a fecal transplant. Perhaps we should be looking at the mouth as seeding the, the, the lung, and that may be a way um, to help uh, restore a good microbiome in the ICU. Um, we could look at uh, improving epithelial repair uh, and stopping leakiness into the circulation as a way to target ARDS. Or we could look at these pathogen associated molecular proteins um, specifically and give uh, therapies that might target them. Uh, or we could also look at the interaction of these um, uh, microbial uh, uh, signals um, that bind uh, to pathogen receptor, uh, pathogen recognition receptors on white blood cells uh, and stimulate inflammation. And perhaps uh, targeting uh, those receptors uh, could also uh, help prevent uh, or treat ARDS. So um, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have done this work. Um, this is uh, you know, many years of a lot of hard work uh, in the ICU, um, particularly Georgios Kitsios, uh, who has really done, uh, you know, the majority of, of this work and has been uh, just uh, fantastic uh, in, in uh, what he has accomplished. Um, my lab, um, the ID division, who we work with closely, um, and the pulmonary division, uh, and all the people who collect these samples uh, and do the analyses, um, and particularly uh, our ICU staff uh, and patients. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Dr. Morris, thank you for that excellent talk. Um, as someone who finished their latest tour of duty in the ICU about 48 hours ago, this all sounds very familiar and not knowing what to do with these things. I'll start with a really broad question. Of the things you spoke about today um, that range from, you know, the experimental stage to attempting clinical application, what is the closest to being readily used in ICUs widely, where someone might expect to use this in the next, say, five years? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the diagnostic is pretty close. And, and we already do, obviously, have some PCR-based um, uh, panels to diagnose infection and, you know, PCR for pneumocystis, PCR for various uh, for viruses, various other bacterial pathogens. So some of that is being applied now. Um, the carious test that I talked about for the cell-free microbial DNA is also um, commercially available. Um, I don't think it's that widely used at this point. You know, the the challenge with a lot of these studies, though, is what is your gold standard, right? Because I described all these culture negative cases where we come up with a pathogen and yes, it's associated with more inflammation. It's associated with worse outcomes, but we don't, you know, the, there, there's no real gold standard diagnosis of pneumonia. So it's, it's really very hard um, to do these kind of studies. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Can you talk about, um, the, I guess it's sort of a chicken and egg question and think about, you know, maybe some of Gary Huffnagel's work at Michigan, which is, does the altered lung microbiome initiate disease pathogenesis? Is it a marker of the fact that injury and inflammation are occurring? Um, and then what about the possibilities for manipulating that uh, to cause therapeutic change? Yeah. So that's also very hard to get at in these kind of studies. Um, you know, and I, 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 there's a whole, um, we have a whole lot of uh, other data showing that perhaps this this may be um, uh, you know it may be causative. Um, we you know I, I didn't get into it because it's a whole that's a whole other talk. Um, we have um, you know some data that when you put the beta glucan on lung epithelial cells, it causes worse injury and inflammation, and that we can reverse that with actually metformin. Um, we have some animal models uh, suggesting that uh, this can be, uh, you know, that, that this can cause damage. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we'll, it needs a lot more work to try to figure that out. And it's always challenging. Um, the manipulation part is really interesting. Obviously, it's much easier for the gut people to manipulate the microbiome, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
putting, you know, microbes in lungs is very challenging. There's been a few animal studies that have done it. Um, I'm not sure what exactly, you know, if you're sort of doing the lung equivalent of a fecal transplant, I'm not sure exactly what you're transferring. Um, Mm -hmm. And then there's lots of obviously issues of inflammation and other things going on. I think what maybe um, is, is attractive is perhaps, you know, manipulating the oral microbiome and that's something we can do. Um, And potentially, you know, some of the stuff we do like decontaminating the mouth Mm -hmm. and people who have a good oral microbiome may not be the right thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we're using systemic antibiotics, just to follow along on that, that thought there, are we decontaminating the lung in some way? I mean, obviously I'm assuming we're, we're changing the microbiome. Yeah. So, you know, we could be decontaminating the lung, but we could also be causing fungal overgrowth. Mm -hmm. So I think Um, the answer is that, you know, the, the real targeted antibiotics. So not, not, not killing everything when you don't need to. Right. Right. Which is often where we start, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of our pulmonary fellows wants to know, can you talk about the use of endotracheal aspirates versus BALs or mini BALs? Um, when you think about your studies, is, is what we would get on a more simple sample related to what you would get on a deeper uh, BAL sample? Yeah, so that's a, that's a question we uh, struggle with uh, a lot. And I think it depends on what you're looking at. I think the endotracheal aspirates for these types of um, diagnostic work are very good. I mean, we get very good concordance with BAL, with blood cultures, um, and with uh, systemic inflammation. So I think, you know, when you're looking at uh, infection um, and potentially the microbiome, it's it's reasonable. When you're looking at other biomarkers, you know, there there's differences for sure, um, and, and and there's going to be differences in you know the alveolar microbiome versus the more proximal microbiome. But, you know, it's a matter of, it's hard to get 400 BALs on patients where it's relatively easy to get endotracheal aspirates and to get them. I didn't show, we have longitudinal data as well. We get day one, five, you know, seven, 10, Hmm. which is really hard. There are, I mean, the Northwestern group is fantastic at getting multiple bronchoscopies and BALs in these patients. And, um, but it's really hard. Yeah. You can imagine. Um, question from the audience about uh, the idea of colonizing species. So if you're doing a microbiome analysis, is there a way to distinguish uh, what one might consider to be a pathogen in that moment versus a colonizer uh, from the work that you're doing? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think it gets back a little bit to sort of this, like, what's the gold standard and how do you figure this out? And one of the ways that Georgios is approaching it is using sort of like a machine learning technique and taking the clinical characteristics, taking what we see um, on the microbiome sequencing, um, and, and then also biomarkers and outcomes and seeing if we can figure out what's a pathogen and what's a colonizer. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems, I mean, it seems like, you know, if you get a dominant bacteria, that's one of the things that we think of as a pathogen, that that seems to be related to, to actual, um, disease, but it gets tough in the orals, right? Because it may just be that the orals are there because that's, they're coming from the mouth and that's okay. Versus it's like an anaerobic pneumonia. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you see a role, um, for using some of this genetic analysis, the lung microbiome, to effectively screen for resistance patterns to antibiotics, virulence factors, other things than just the um, presence of uh, the pathogen itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that, that nanopore and the metagenomic um, techniques are really going to be the way to do that because they give much more specific. You can get the resistance pattern very quickly. Um, And we also, I'm working with, um, Gotti Hader in ID, uh, who has his case on looking at, you know, rectal swabs, uh, oral swabs and endotracheal aspirates in transplant patients and coming from the time of transplant and seeing, you know, do we see resistant bugs early on? And does that signal, you know, a problem that's going to develop later? Um, so I think it's going to be really useful for that. And can we do things, you know, intervene earlier on before we get an actual clinical, um, infection? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of your slides, you were, I think early on in the talk, when you mentioned the hyperinflammatory and non-hyperinflammatory uh, phenotypes of ARDS, 
uh, it showed that patients with hyperinflammatory phenotype of ARDS have higher circulating levels, higher levels of circulating bacteria detectable in the serum, yet better clinical outcomes. Uh, the question asker is wondering if you have a hypothesis as to why this is so. Um, I'm not sure we showed us. We, we have, we were not able to look at outcomes in that group yet. Mm -hmm. It's too small. Okay. So no outcomes there. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Nope. That's all right. Um, another question, uh, from our pulmonary group, it, it moves away from ARDS a little bit, but are you at all optimistic about modification of the microbiome using either pre-antibiotics or probiotics, um, as a way to treat, uh, more chronic lung diseases? Is that something your, your group thinks about? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I my interest in this actually started uh, in chronic lung disease and, you know, in HIV and COPD and how uh, that might be related. Um, uh, and and we've, we have found uh, particularly pneumocystis and actually beta deglucan in the blood as important um, in people with COPD, both with HIV uh, and uh, people who uh, aren't infected with HIV. And so I, I do think there's I think we're really sort of at the tip of the iceberg and really understanding um, the role. And there's, you know, the, the field has um, grown tremendously in the past few years and, and, you know, more and more data starting to come out. Um, and so I do think there'll hopefully be ways that we can modify and get a good microbiome, but I'm not sure we know what that is yet. Makes sense. A couple of questions about viruses and, and fungi. Um, <clears throat> I think we have time for a few more. Uh, in your microbiome and your ARDS data, have you looked at viruses in all three of your um, endpoint groups? And the question asker, asker says, I know it's harder, but it's interesting to see if the high diversity group has viral infections. Yeah, so um, we have a bit because the nanopore will get the virus um, and there are a group um, that do have viral infections. And, and actually there was, we had one patient who had uh, HIV who came in and was in respiratory failure um, and uh, had a bronchoscopy that was negative, but looking at the, the, um, the uh, nucleic acids in his blood, we actually picked up HHV8 and he went on later on to be diagnosed with KS. It wasn't, you couldn't see it on the BA, on the bronchoscopy when you did. So we are seeing that in a smaller number of patients. Um, and we are certainly, we're actually seeing, I didn't show the data, um, but we have data of um, uh, viremia from SARS-CoV-2 uh, in relationship to outcomes. And it's, it's similar to this, right? But, mm -hmm. but no, we haven't gone and really done a full scale uh, multiviral um, investigation, which would be okay. great. Yeah, no, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Janoff, one of our infectious disease doctors asks, uh, given the frequency of culture negative or pathogen negative um, pneumonias by microbiome analysis, is it possible the normal bi microbiome itself and not necessarily known pathogens are causing pneumonias? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, again, right, it's very difficult to get at. And I think by looking at the entire patient, um, the host response uh, and the outcome, you can get at that. But I think, you know, it, these trials are gonna be tough to do, right? Because it's gonna have to be going in and saying to clinicians, here's the microbiome data. Now you gotta stop antibiotics. And that'll be the wrong decision in some people. So it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have time for one last question. One of our pulmonary fellows has a, a follow-on question to an earlier one is, have you considered seeing what a single dose of fluconazole does to uh, the microbiome and, and biologic diversity in the lung um, for later infections that we may, that we may see or treat later on? Yeah, no, that, that would be very interesting and perhaps, um, you know, a, a, a doable study to just give a dose and sample before and after for proof of concept and then also do the the beta deglucan before and after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Work that work has not been done yet. I'm, I'm guessing. Not that I'm aware of. Fair enough. Um, okay. Well, it is one o'clock, uh, and we peppered you with a lot of questions. So Dr. Morris, thank you very much. I mean, this is just so interesting and obviously incredibly, incredibly clinically relevant. Um, really appreciate having you out here today, uh, to join us for grand rounds. Great. Thank you so much.